archetypes, and the collective unconscious. Exploring the depths of the collective unconscious, a journey into Carl Jung's insights. Welcome everyone to today's lecture on one of the most intriguing concepts in psychology, the collective unconscious, as conceptualized by pioneering Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung. In this session, we will embark on a journey into the depths of the human psyche, exploring Jung's revolutionary ideas that have left an indelible mark on the field of psychology and beyond. So, an overview of Carl Jung. Before delving into the collective unconscious, let's briefly acquaint ourselves with the remarkable mind behind this concept, Carl Gustav Jung. Born in 1875 in Switzerland, Jung was a contemporary of Sigmund Freud and a prominent figure in the development of analytical psychology. Throughout his life, Jung delved into the realms of mythology, religion, anthropology, and alchemy, drawing inspiration from diverse cultural sources to enrich his understanding of the human psyche. The concept of the collective unconscious At the heart of Jung's psychological framework lies the concept of the collective unconscious. Unlike the personal unconscious, which compromises an individual's repressed or forgotten memories, the collective unconscious represents a deeper layer of the psyche shared by all human beings across cultures and generations. It is the reservoir of universal symbols, archetypes, and primordial images that shape our thoughts, behaviors, and emotions. Archetypes Central to Jung's theory of the collective unconscious innate psychological structures that manifest as recurring motifs, themes, or symbols in the myths, dreams, and cultural narratives. These archetypes, such as the hero, the mother, the trickster, and the shadow, exert a profound influence on behave human behavior, often operating beyond conscious awareness. Through exploring uh, archetypal patterns, Jung believed individuals could gain insight into their unconscious drives and motivations, leading to greater self-awareness and individuation. Here's a picture of what that would look like, our types of the collective unconscious. <clears throat> so an archetype is a universal, this is just a summary, archetype is a universal archaic symbols and images that derive from the collective unconscious. They are psychic counterparts of instincts. Example, the Imago Dei, the God image, is the reflection of the archetype in the human spirit. In the collective unconscious, the objective psyche, it refers to the idea that is a segment of the deepest unconscious mind is genetically inherited and is not shaped by personal experience. There you go. Here we have the creation of Adam. Um, this is a really beautiful image if you look at it really closely. It's just like um, uh, a representation of the Mago Day here we have that we are made in God's image. So this would be God here and this would be Adam. Just a nice little artistry that we can reflect on. Anyway, continue. Art intuitively apprehends coming changes in the collective unconscious. This is a quote by Carl Jung. <clears throat> Here we have an image. It's a very uh, interesting image. I mean, take a deeper look at it. You can see here we have some towels hanging on a moon. And then like a little baby's basket looks like. I'm not too sure what this means, but... Art is definitely very hand in hand, goes hand in hand with the collective unconscious. Alright, so according to Jung, the ego represents the conscious mind as it compromises the thoughts, memories, and emotions a person is aware of. The ego is largely responsible for feelings of identity and continuity. It's conscious. The shadow. The shadow is either an unconscious aspect of the personality that the conscious ego does not identify in itself, 
or the entirety of the unconscious. Example, everything of which a person is not fully conscious. In short, the shadow is the unknown side, the unconscious. Then we have the persona, the social face the individual represents to the world, a kind of mask designed to the designed on the one hand to make a def definite impression upon others and on the other to conceal the true nature of the individual. This is conscious. Then we have the anima and slash animus, either new concepts. Um, so Jung described the animus as the unconscious masculine side of a woman and the anima as the unconscious feminine side of a man, each transcending the personal psyche, the unconscious. So this is unconscious. I'll take a show you guys image of this. Show you guys here. Um, zoom in. There you can see here we have the self, the ego, the persona, the shadow, the animal such animus, and how it kind of works around this circle, the model of the psyche. Young believed that the psyche is self-regulating system, rather like the body, one that seeks to maintain a balance between opposite, opposing qualities while constantly striving for growth, a process Young called individuation. All right. So, that being said, let's talk about the shadow. The shadow is the living, is a living part of person personality, and therefore wants to live with it in some form. It cannot be argued out of existence or rationalized into harmlessness. This problem is exceedingly difficult because it not only challenges the whole man. Rhymes reminds him at the same time of his helplessness and effect ineffect ineffectuality. So here we have the shadow. It is a frightening thought that man also has a shadow side to him, consisting not just of little weaknesses and for and foibles, but of positively demonic dynamism. Very scary stuff, yo. Yeah. But we move on. This is what the lecture is about. Okay, so the dark side of our unconscious. Here we have a picture of the Lion King. We have uh, Mufasa's uncle or the br the brother leading basically a Nazi regime here. Um, uh, consider this political agenda of some sort, some type of dark political agenda of some sort. He's leading an army to go do bad things, and that's not good. So yeah, this is just saying that this is like a radically, that if the radical left was uh, it's describing the shadow side of things, so mass graves in the Soviet Union were used for the burial of mass numbers of citizens and the foreigners executed by the government of the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin. These mass killings were carried out by security organizations such as the NKVD and reached their peak in the Great Purge of 1937-38. 20 million people were killed by the radical left. So this just goes to show how far um, some of these uh, shadow sides can go and shadow manifestations can go and deployed on collective people mm -hmm. so there is a man in an imago not only of the mother but of the daughter here let me show you guys the statue first the anima the inner feminine side of a man the anima is both a personal complex and an archetypal image of woman in the male psyche There isn't a man, not only a, an imago, not only of the mother, but of the daughter, the sister, and the beloved, the heavenly, and the goddess, and the Siddhartha Babo. Every mother and every beloved is forced to become the carrier and embodiment of this omnipresent and ageless image, which corresponds to the deepest reality in a man. It belongs to him.
This perilous image of a woman, she stands out for the loyalty which is in which in the interest of her life he must sometimes forego. She is the much needed compensation of the rich struggles sacrificed that all end in disappointments. She is the solace for all the bitterness of life. This is very relatable for most men. I hope you guys can truly understand what that means for you guys' souls. This one cuts deep as well. The psychological aspect of the mother archetype. Alright, so. Let me read the notes for that. Mother complex. Definition. A group of feelings, toned ideas associated with the experience and image of mother. Mother complex is potentially active component in everyone's psyche, informed first of all by experience of the personal mother, then by significant contact with other women, and by typical effects on the son or home, and atypically effects. On this. So basically, it's saying that um, this there's a. The son's entire heterosexuality is tied to the mother in an unconscious form. So he unconsciously seeks his mother in every woman he meets, which makes him homosexual. Yeah, so that's what that means. A man's mother complex is influenced by contrasexual complexes. The anima, to the extent that a man establishes a good relation with his inner woman instead of being possessed by her, even another a negative mother complex may have positive effects. There we go. So concerning rebirth, let me get you guys on this slide. So this is the phoenix, my one of my favorite images of rebirth. Deal. Well, let me get the slides going. Rebirth, the process experienced as a renewal of or transformation of, of the personality. See also individuation. I'd also, I'd also um, definitely refer to this as a baptism of the soul. And it says in the Bible that your man can only be baptized by water and the Holy Spirit. And that's the only man that can be reborn again in the spirit and it can enter the kingdom of heaven so i think that is important to to mention here rebirth is not a process entirely is not a process that we can can in any way observe we can either measure nor weigh nor photograph it is entirely beyond perception one speaks of when one speaks of rebirth young distinguished between five different forms of rebirth Transmigration of souls, body resurrection, psychological rebirth, which is individuation, and indirect change that comes about through participation in the process of transformation. Psychological rebirth was Jung's particular focus, induced by rituals or stimulated by immediate personal experience. It results in an enlargement of the personality. He acknowledged that one might feel transformed during a certain group experiences. But he cautioned against confusing this with genuine rebirth. If any considerable groups of persons are united and identified with one another by a particular frame of mind, the resultant transformation experience bears only a remote resemblance to the experience of individual transformation. The group experience takes place on a lower level of consciousness than the experience of individual of an individual. This is due to the fact that when man, many people gathered together to share one common emotion, the total psyche emerging from the group is below the level of the individual psyche. If it is a very large group, the collective psyche will be more like the psyche of an animal. Interesting to know. This group experience goes no deeper than the level of one's own mind in that state. It does not work a change in you, but the change does not last. Let's go to this slide. Psychology of the child archetype. Many of you know this image. This is a very archetypal image of Simba being raised by the the sage here, the monkey, and uh, the Lion King. 
and uh, yeah, let's break it down. We all have observed a 70 year old behaving like a child, throwing tantrums or hiding from their caretakers. We have experienced the occasional urge to engage in an um, impulsive shopping and our tendency to sulk and to expect others to console us. These are all expressions of the child archetypes in us. We usually associate qualities of innocence, impulsiveness, spontaneity, creativity, as well as other, as well as those of dependence, naive, naivety, ignorance, stubbornness, with our idea of a child. These qualities of the child archetype often manifest, them, manifest themselves in different ways for each of us. One of the first qualities that we associate with the ch idea of a child is innocence. The innocent aspect of a child archetype is naive as well as playful. Those of us in whom this aspect of the child archetype is prominent would find themselves to be generally easygoing, having a carefree approach, and being able to trust others easily. Such childlike innocence is beautifully exemplified in characters like Peter Pan and Snow White. When the innocent child in us healthily integrated, is healthily integrated into psychically, it enables us to nurture the innocent, playful, lighthearted side in us along with being able to carry out responsibilities of adulthood with relative ease and balance. However, at times when we feel overwhelmed with challenges in our lives, this innocent child might not feel prepared to face them. It discovers that the world around us is not ideal, not fair, nor fair, and contains imperfections at every stage. As this child happy, the child's happy bubble breaks, it leads to feelings of despair, and the child finds itself feeling overwhelmed. It is at such times when the shadow of the child archetype could come into play, and the child begins to find comfort in retreating into fantasy. We find ourselves refusing to acknowledge our concerns or deny them, and on, and on a broader note, we refuse to grow up and take responsibility of the situation. Thus, the shadow side of the child is dominant in individuals who grow overly independent of others to help them deal with their problems. At other times, when the child in us is wounded, probably stemming from a harsh environment or severely negative events, the child archetype becomes a source of strength for our psyche that is grappling with the pain. Usually popular Popular figures like Cinderella and Harry Potter depict the strengths of the child archetype. Both of them were orphans and experienced a painfully difficult childhood. However, they succeeded in their quest of transitioning into adulthood. Okay. So we have a few more slides here and then we're going to wrap this up. <clears throat> the Phenomenology of the Spirit Fairy Tales. An archetype and functional a complex often personify an experience as enlivening, enlivening, analogous to what the archaic mind felt to be an invisible breath-like presence. Um, from the psychological point of view, the phenomenon of spirit like every autonomous complex appears as an intention of the unconscious superior to our, or at least on par with intentions of the ego. If we are to do justice to the essence of the thing we call spirit, we should really speak of a higher consciousness rather than of the unconscious. The common modern idea of a spirit ill accords with the Christian view, which regards it as a sum bonum, as God himself. Uh, to be sure, there is also the idea of an evil spirit, but the modern idea cannot be equated with the either. Since for us, spirit is not necessarily evil, we would have to call it morally indifferent or neutral. Uh, since this is a Christian channel, I would definitely do some research that says in the Bible, test the spirits for, test the spirits, um, to see what fruit they bear, something like that. The archetype of the wise old man first appears in the father, being a personification of meaning in its procreative self, sense. The sage archetype called Senex, Old Man in Latin by Jung, is one of wisdom, knowledge, and power. It represents an innate spiritual aspect of our personality in the unconscious, and according to Carl Jung, appears in our lives through different symbols. It may take form, form of people, dreams, insights, or our lives learning to pass on to each other. The last one here, I think I'm going to break down the 12 in my next episode. 12 archetypes.
We have the trickster, the riddler, the keeper of balance. He of many faces who find them, who finds life and death, and who fears no evil, who walks through doors. So the trickster is an alchemist, a magician, creating rallies and duality of time and illusion. Breaks the rules of nature, becomes sometimes maliciously, for example, but usually with ultimately positive effects. I'll break this down later in a later episode, but these are just examples of archetypes that we can relate to, or at least ponder upon until the next episode. So individuation refers to the process through which a person achieves a sense of individuality separate from the identities of others and begins to consciously exist as human in the world. The purpose of individuation of the indi of the individual individuation process is to increase the in individual's consciousness. Um, yeah, so basically, um, with greater consciousness, the individuals can heal splits in their mind between what's conscious and unconscious, bringing them to wholeness in their psyche. In the first half of life. We make our way through the world, doing our best to develop healthy egos. The first portion of life is mainly external as we seek to meet our basic needs. From Jung's outlook, the second part of life can represent a turning inward toward a deeper part of ourselves. This inward turn starts the individuation process. Alright. And here we have just some images I want you guys to reflect on. From a lady who was doing some paintings of individual or she was doing paintings I like at the individuation process so she was just painting some paintings and this was was her progress over some time and as you can see it just progressed into some beautiful artworks this here she you can see she was by the shoreline here by some rocks looks very pretty and then something here happened like now a lightning bolt hit some stone and then let's see here uh, yeah yo this is beautiful stuff man I cannot tell you what it means but I can only tell you that it looks beautiful man These are all mandalas, Christian mandalas. Well, this mandalas. <clears throat> yeah. does something to inside of your soul like when you, you know uh, look at these images you know all right I'm gonna wrap this up in this last image here at the end thank you guys for watching stay tuned for another episode of the individuation process and easy <clears throat>